So welcome back to part two of looking at this EMI audition or artist test as it was called of the 6th of June 1962. Now there's been a lot of views, there's been a lot of questions as well. So I want to try and answer some of those questions in this video. Firstly, got a correction to make. Thank you to my friend Ken pointing out, of course, George Martin didn't visit the cabin to watch the Beatles until he was looking at how to make the first album. So that was not with Pete, that was with Ringo. So correction on that one. But a lot of people have also been saying, well, hang on, I'm just regurgitating what we think other people have said. So this time, from the people who were there, here's some quotations. So first of all, this is Ken Townsend, one of the engineers on the 6th of June, 62. He explains how the Beatles came to be there, to be doing this artist test, doing this audition. Probably a lot of people know me more by the fact I worked on loads of Beatles sessions and did a few technical things which are remembered by some people. Um, but I don't think many people know about how the Beatles actually came to be here at Abbey Road on the 6th of June 1962. Um, it's a long and winding road to a certain degree, but um, at that time, every every town and village virtually had a pop band. And um, most of them were fairly good, but um, you know, it's very hard to get a record contract because at EMI, we had Clifford in the shadows. And the general impression was that if you got somebody on a pop group on your label, you didn't need a second one because your marketing budget and your sales budget wouldn't, wouldn't cover the cost of having one, one group competing against another. And anyway, the, the, the Beatles um, had, had been for an artist test at, on January the 1st, 1962 at Decca, just up the road. Now, Decca were our main rivals, really, in those, in those days. They'd started in 1921, 1929, up here in um, West Hampstead. And, um, uh, but they, they were been up there, and they were rather ridiculed by Bill Rowe and two of the shadows, Tony Mean and Jet Harris, was that, were, were, had moved up there. And Tony Bean was an A&R man. Anyway, they were rejected out of hand by, um, by um, Decker. And they say, they say, or Brian Epstein say, they'd already tried um, to get a radical contract with the MI, um, but nobody was interested. And well, the, the next part of the story was that Brian Epstein took, he took a, he took a tape down to um, the HMV studios in Oxford Street, and um, he, he wanted a disc cut. And, um, the strange thing was that we at Abbey Road used to go down, I used to go down there occasionally with Arthur Pook. We used to check out their, um, their uh, disc cutting equipment because they, it, it was situated on the mezzanine floor of the, um, of the, of the Oxford Street store. Anyway, he went in there and, um, he, he cut this, he cut a, he cut a disc from the, um, from his tape. And the engineer there was Jim Foy, and um, he he asked he asked um, Jim whether what he thought of it. It was I think it's quite good. He said, and he said, well, what, what do you know? What any idea what I could do? He said, well, there's a in the floor above. There's a there's a there's a music publishing company called Beechwood and Ard Ardmore and Beechwood. He said and. Um, there's a chap called Sid Coleman up there. I, I can take it up to him and see what he thinks. So they, they, he, he rang Sid Coleman and um, he told him that, yeah, pop up and see me and I'll have a listen. And he went up there and he said, yeah, that's all right. He said, have you tried EMI? He said, well, I've tried. This, is, this was to Brian Epstein. I've tried EMI, he said, but there's nobody, um, nobody particularly interested. Uh, he said, have you tried George Martin? I mean, he's, got, he's done um, quite a few things recently and um, got some success with um, quite a few records. And um, he said, no, I haven't tried him. So they phoned, they phoned George and um, um, spoke to his secretary, who was um, Judy Lockhart-Smith, now Judy Martin, then became Judy Martin. And she arranged for me to come up and see George. And that's how George organised an artist test at Abbey Road on the 6th of June, 1962. Right, having told you how, how George got the, um, 
lumbered to a certain degree, possibly was the word, to have a commercial test for this group called the Beatles. Um, he arranged it to happen on the 6th of June 19, 6, 1962, which actually was the anniversary of D-Day, which was a lot of, it was a day that a lot of people wanted to celebrate the, the landing in, 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 of, on D-Day. Anyway, um, George had arranged this, this session on the 6th of June 1962, or provisionally did, and on the Friday before, the, um, the, 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 um, the weekly programme was, was being published and penciled in was commercial tests for George Martin on, this, on, this, on the um, Wednesday. When I got home that evening, um, there was a phone call from George Martin. First time I've ever had a phone call um, from George, I think, at home. And he explained that he's got this group coming up from Liverpool on the, um, on the Wednesday. He said, I've got Norman Smith to do it. Um, now, I'd like one of my team on it, if possible, he said. Um, Could you please come up and work on the session? And um, I said, um, OK, George, yeah. So on the 6th of June 1962, I was here in Abbey Road, and I was, I'd agreed to work on this um, session. And, um, and on the 6th of June, um, the, the, the session was scheduled to be originally 7 to 10, but I think it was changed till 7 to 9, actually. And Norman Smith came in to see me in the amp room, and he'd got his session sheet laid out, which he'd written out, and he was checking with me about the microphone positions because I'd worked on loads and loads and loads of um, Cliff Richard and the Shadow sessions. And um, what, what Norman did was fine, actually. Um, anyway, I came, um, we got a phone call. I was, I was here in the afternoon, and it was only, we got a phone call saying, could they start an hour early? Now, fortunately, that was possible because um, the control room was in use, but the studio wasn't. So I managed to set up the studio b before, and then, um, and once once this was clear, I lined up all the tape machines and put um, put tones on the tape, etc. Um, and Norman then came in, and we check. I checked everything out. At that time, um, I was sat exactly where you're sitting, basically, and Norman was stood in the window. And I was just finishing up putting these, doing the final checkovers on the on the tape machine with the azimuth and um, etc. And um, Norman looked out the window. He says. What the heck have we got here? Um, <laughs> look down, there's these four young lads walking through, all looking identical. And so Norman and I walked down to the studio and um, I put out the distribution boards and, um, um, and chatted to them. And um, I was immediately taken back by their, their sense of humour and um, the way they were and the fact they all look the same. Um, they're, they're like four clones. Once they arrived, um, I went downstairs with Norman Smith and spoke to them, and I was quite knocked out by their, by the way they were, and um, their sense of humour, and particular their Scouser accent. And um, I got on quite well with them actually. And um, we set up their um, equipment, and um, George Martin then arrived upstairs here, and we started recording. And I think it was Bessie Me Mucho the first one we did. And there was this terrible sound from the bass guitar. Um, it was a rasping. I, you can describe it really as a farting sound, really. And um, we tried several things to um, cure that. Norman Smith lo lowered the level downstairs and raised it up here to no effect. And so um, George basically said, "Look, unless we can do something about it, we'll have to abandon this session. We can't. We can't um, put on tape this this dreadful noise." Um, so they retired to, they went to the um, canteen and had, had some tea while myself and I, th I think Norman was with me but I, th I had this idea about getting the loudspeaker out of the, out of echo chamber one which is a big tannery speaker and um, put, getting a TL12 amplifier I had upstairs on my desk which was going to take to, um, to Rome with me and um, I fixed up this um, 
um, this in the thing and, and sorted out the what sort of jack socket was required and tried it all and um, when they came back lo and behold it actually worked which was incredible really so we carried on working so I often think of that's sometimes I think that's what I was brought on this earth to do uh. so the Beatles didn't make a great start to the audition with all kinds of problems particularly with Paul's amplifier and speaker which ironically they still hadn't fixed by the time they came back on the 4th of September 62 but that's another story one of the other people there Ken has mentioned is Norman Smith now Norman was one of those guys who was helping to record the audition for Ron Richards and he was also a drummer he had his own uh, jazz quintet and he once drummed for the Beatles as well but this was what he thought of the session and he also comments on Pete's drumming as well. These guys to me were special uh, right from the very time I met them and their personality came will hit me you know. Uh, took George a little time to get used to it because he had George Martin anyway he wasn't used to that that kind of uh, uh, rock group call it that anyway as you you may know the type of records that he made. I'm very good at it, of course, at that, but uh, he wasn't that interested in, in guitar groups, you know, playing that. I could understand he, 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 his lack of enthusiasm to begin with, as I've said, because they, they didn't show anything uh, at the audition. But it, of course, then wasn't long before it, particularly, I mean, Love Me Do was not a great hit. We had a bit of a struggle. George didn't actually come to the first recording of uh, Love Me Do. His assistant came, and uh, Ron, Ron Richards, and myself. So we were left to Love Me Do, the first record. It wasn't terribly successful, no, not because of our fault, but because uh, it just wasn't happening, you know, and particularly Ron thought and later George, because of Pete Best, uh, his drumming. But I still say it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was the, it wasn't a very, it wasn't a decent arrangement. He was a decent enough drummer, it, it, it wasn't that at all. This is solely my opinion that, um, you know, uh, it was mainly down to what he was playing and not how he was playing. So let's now look at what happened after the session. Now in the first video, I repeated what Paul had said when talking to Mark Lewison in the Beatles recording sessions. Now he says that George Martin came to John Paul and George and told him about wanting to get rid of Pete. This, now with my personal opinion and those of others, is highly unlikely. There's no reason why George Martin, on the first session, first time meeting these guys, would go and speak to three members of the band and say, get rid of your drummer. So that doesn't sound right. What did happen and we'll have this in just a moment in George Martin's own words, is he took Brian to one side and told him that he was going to bring in a session drummer. So this is what George Martin said. Even though they had uh, nothing really behind them, they were still fairly irreverent even in those days, which I, which I loved. You know, I, I, I like a little bit of rebel in people, and I like their sense of humour. Uh, after all, that was my main stock in trade too. And I guess they quite liked what I'd been doing with... Peter Sellers and the Goons, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I think they, they had tremendous charisma. I knew that that alone would sell them. And we did a reasonable audition, not very good, but the thing he didn't like was our drummer. And I said to Brian Epstein, if when we do the next session, I mean, I don't want to interfere with the Beatles and what you're doing with them, that's fine, but I'm going to provide the drummer. So there you have it, three eyewitnesses, Ken Townsend, Norman Smith, George Martin. So we know the ball started rolling now after the June audition to replace Pete Best. I'll do a whole video just on all the reasons for Pete being fired. Um, there is a video if you want to watch it on why he wasn't legally, it didn't actually happen that way. And also who replaced him. So you can uh, watch that video if you want to. But I'll do one just on why the Beatles wanted to replace Pete and all the excuses, all the myths, all the reasons, and everything each of the Beatles and their entourage ever said about it as well. So keep tuned. Thank you for subscribing. And again, don't forget in the comments, 
make some comments, ask questions, fine, more than happy to do that. And I'll see you next time.